welcome. I'm Lori Carbon, I'm Executive Director of McLean Project for the Arts, and I come to you from our exquisite Emerson Gallery in the McLean Community Center. If you missed last night's opportunity to be with Nancy Saucer, our Exhibitions Director and Curator, please check it out online. She's giving a walkthrough along with Sharon Fischel, NPA Director of Art Reach, for this marvelous exhibition with work by the Washington Sculptors Group, Sculpture Now. Please look for it on our website and or on the event section of the MPA Art Fest site. Today, I welcome you to the ongoing Meet the Artist series, a real silver lining of MPA Art Fest 2020. We thank BOA, the design, build, and remodeling experts based here in McLean for 32 years for their support of this week and their support of us for almost as many as those 32 years. It's taken a lot of work to put on MPA Virtual Art Fest 2020, and it's been worth it. A silver lining is time together with you and for you to have time with our artists, getting to know them, getting to know about their medium, their background, their interests, and an opportunity to go back to their website here on, or back to their artist studio, excuse me, their very own artist studio on mpaartfest.org and find a little bit of Art Fest joy that you can take home with you. Thanks so much for being with us. We look forward to you continuing to be part of this series. Hello and welcome to NPA Art Fest Artist Talks. I'm Cynthia Miller and I'm an Act 5 artist and on the Education Committee of the NPA Art Fest 2020. To those of you who are new to NPA Art Fest, we're now in our 14th year. NPA brings art and the community together, offering events, music, artwork, and so much, much more. This year we are thrilled to bring you 52 exhibiting artists. I encourage you, if you haven't already visited, to head on over to the MPA Artist Studios in the Artist section of the MPA website and check out their works. I'm excited to in introduce to you three artists this morning, John Adams, Fran Abrams, and JJ Singh. So please, come join me. Hello, John. So Hello. nice to meet you. If you would give me, a, give us, our audience, a few of your most formative learning experiences as you developed as an artist, and what made these experiences so valuable to you where you are today? Okay, thank you. Um, oh, where to start? Um, I think that some of my most formative experiences that may have happened within a classroom uh, were some of my experiences at VCU Arts or at JMU. Um, I was very fortunate to work with some fantastic professors, including uh, Phil Meggs and uh, John Hawthorne at VCU, and um, just people that really got me to think about and uh, immerse myself in, you know, art and design. And uh, later on, I would definitely say, uh, hmm, probably, uh, you know, my own experience doing site-specific work um, and then having the opportunity to interact with uh, Patrick Doherty uh, working at the Greater Reston Art Center on his sculpture at Reston Town Center um, and several other artists uh, that I had the opportunity to work with there when I was the education director. Um, those had a huge impact on me um, as well as uh, my experiences at graduate school and JMU where they really did a great job of making things real and, you know, getting to sit across the table from Donald Cuspit and Peter Plagans and talk to 
uh, you know, critics and, and art historians and, uh, you know, you weren't just reading their books. You, you actually had the opportunity to interact with them. And just those opportunities to make things real. Wow, that's fabulous. So give us an overview of some of the core themes and practices in your work today. And how did they evolve? Um, well, currently, um, over the past few years, I've been very interested in what happens when snippets of perception get uh, edited, reconfigured, um, and compartmentalized, and, and how we derive meaning from that. Um, I've always been very interested in perception, uh, whether it's, uh, you know, kind of the artist's initial uh, perception of an idea to the, uh, the viewer who's, who's coming in and interacting with that work and receiving that perception. Um, so, uh, or forming their own perceptions from that. So, uh, that, that's kind of where I'm at now. Um, I was just going to ask you to turn, if you wanted to point to something in your, in your studio that, that uh, visually would, would help connect us to those thoughts, that would probably help our viewer sure. a lot. Yeah, no problem. So, um, yeah, kind of behind me, um, if we take a look at this painting that's up here, uh, that, that is going to be included. I'm, I'm sorry? Yeah, just push it over a teensy bit more to your right. Oh, yeah, no problem. Oh, perfect. Yeah, now we can see it. Ah. Um, so with, with a painting like this, uh, I'm actually creating a painting and uh, then taking that painting apart and reconfiguring um, the elements to create that repetitious rhythm there and then working back into the painting once everything's been reconfigured. Um, another way that I might do that uh, would be fascinating. A glare, but yeah. Um, so with this painting, I'm actually uh, layering multiple compositions uh, from slightly different points of view, slightly different. Uh, color schemes and, uh, you know, trying to set up this situation where it's, uh, where, where really you're in between the images and your brain is having to make these connections to try to create this new image versus what's actually there. Um, so for me, that, that, process of looking and perceiving not only for me as the artist coming up with the idea or developing the work but uh for the viewer to actually have that be a, a big part of the meaning and the experience um you know that that's where i've been focusing the bulk of my energy over the past few years wow so tell us a little bit about your processes then. So when you walk into the studio, do you have several things going at once and, uh, or, you know, how do you start versus whatever, you know, all those, all those different, just give us. Sure. Um, so when I walk in the studio, there are definitely more, there's definitely more than one artwork going at a time. Um, I can take you for a quick walk around and, uh, you know, maybe you can see, get an idea of how much might be going on. So, sorry, I'm muted there. So, I might have a few paintings uh, at, at different uh, stages here, um, whether they're, you know, sketches and studies on paper that uh, can later get developed and uh, turned into uh, new pieces um, or, uh, you know, paintings that I've been working on for, you know, quite a while to, I don't know if you can see there, but that's a rack full of new panels, um, you know, that are, are going to be paintings very soon. Um, so, I definitely have things in many different stages of progress. So again, 
more large panels that are being constructed here. Um, wow. So maybe, so, so yeah, I, I don't complete one thing before I start another one. There are always things going in the studio and that just helps to keep the momentum for me. How often do you experiment when you're working? Um, while I'm uh, pretty much all the time. <laughs> but I think I just so uh, yeah. So I I will experimentation is a big part of my work. Um, I definitely start out by doing uh, quite a bit of planning before I begin a work. Um, all of my color schemes are, uh, you know, I start out by putting together color studies, which are just blocks of color, specific, very specific observed color that I'm combining together. And I'll have those as a reference, either on my computer or sometimes in my sketchbook. And that's kind of my starting point and always the point that I'm coming back to if I start to get a little bit off track. But um, as I'm working, as you can see, I, I keep a bunch of pieces of paper around for me to experiment and test out different ideas. Um, uh, so that, that's an important part of the process. Yeah, and I, I can see that. Are you, are there some ideas that are out there that you're thinking about trying that you would share with us? Um, well, recently, uh, let's say, just before uh, the pandemic started and, and everything kind of got weird, um, I had started to have some opportunities for larger scale works. And because I had been, uh, I, I had moved my studio and re relocated from the Northern Virginia area to Richmond. Um, you know, I have a four year old, all these kinds of things. I, I was working smaller uh, to make things more manageable. Um, and, you know, as I've gotten the larger studio set up and, uh, you know, gotten some additional opportunities, um, I'm, you know, definitely starting to work larger on, uh, you know, individual artworks. Um, some of my site specific works have been very large, uh, but in terms of like a painting that you can pull off the wall, not so much. Yeah. Would you say, uh, give us a little more uh, information about your site-specific works? I, I was just amazed when I saw them online. And, and unless people have looked at your work, they may not really understand what that's all about, how you get started, how, what the process is, and whatnot. Okay. So the site-specific works are, um, they're drawings that are created on location, typically on location for that specific location. Um, and often I've been given the opportunity or the challenge to work with an irregular space, um, the uh, accordion wall in the atrium gallery of MPA. It was one of those spaces. <laughs> or in, yes, or the, uh, the atrium in the, uh, uh, at the Schlesinger Center at Northern Virginia Community College in Alexandria was another one of those spaces uh, where there may be angles, corners, um, non-continuous spaces where you may not be able to see the entire drawing from one location. Um, so with those pieces, I was always trying to be very conscious of the space and have the viewer have to move through the gallery space or through the architectural space in order to experience the drawing. And I think that goes back to that interest in, in perception and the process of perceiving. And, um, you know, for me, that process is just as important as my process in the studio in terms of communicating with the viewer. Wow, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I was taken away, and I'm looking at it online, so I can well imagine in person. Uh, are there any untried themes that you've been maybe also exploring or not, that you would share? 
Um, well, I think, you know, uh, that's a, that's a tough question. I mean, as of, you know, you always have ideas and there are always tangents that you can go off on as an artist. And especially if you feel comfortable with experimentation, I think that happens more frequently. And so, um, I mean, I don't know. I have, I have stacks of little ideas that I may come back to or may not come back to, but I think that that's part of just how I try to keep momentum. Um, the, the pieces that I'm, that I am showing here at, uh, MPA, uh, art fest are, uh, they're actually work that came out of an experiment say in like 2005, I think it was, wow. um, where I was masking off areas for paintings and I just stuck some of them on the wall to put the tape out of the way. And I looked at them and thought, oh, maybe I, I can do something with those cast offs. So I made some very small sketches and I made 10 or 15 of those and then put them away. Um, I came back to that process when it made sense for me uh, because uh, my son was born, I was bringing him in the studio with me. Uh, my time was uh, extremely fragmented. So I had to change my process completely. And all of a sudden, that process where I was taking these bits of old information and putting them together in new ways, that just made sense to me because I could walk into the studio and, uh, and, and, jump right into the challenge. Uh, so um, that's, uh, uh, that's just fabulous. Would you, is there anything that I haven't asked you that you want to make sure that uh, the listeners and viewers know about you as an artist that um, you'd like to relate at this, at this point in time? That, that's my final question for you. Um, well, I think, one of the questions that I get most frequently uh, at an art fair is um, like, where, where does the imagery come from? Where do the color schemes come from? And, um, you know, e even though the work is, um, is, is non-objective or, or abstract, depending on how you look at it, um, I'm definitely pulling that imagery and uh, those color schemes from life, from observation. Um, so they're, they're not internally generated. Um, I think they're, they're external and then internally processed and, you know, and, and worked out. And that's where they come from. I spend a lot of time outside. Um, I do a lot of gardening, hiking, canoeing, those kinds of things. Um, and I think that influences influences it as much as like the structure of our man-made environment of being in the city or being in the suburbs of, of the, the, the patterns and repetitions of our daily lives and, you know, raising our families and those kinds of things. Well, it's obvious when we look at the wall behind you that many of your themes come from nature and, and those colors. It's been a real pleasure, John, to talk with you and I can't wait to, to see your exhibit and thank you very much for being part of our Art Fest 2020. Fran Abrams, it's such a delight to meet you. I'm really looking forward to hearing about your story. Thank so, you. <laughs> um, I I read in, in one of the pieces of information about you, it says that Fran, uh, the aim is to establish polymer clay in the fine art world. Can you tell us what does that mean to those of us that really don't know much? Well, I have had over the past 20 years, I've had my work accepted into shows that are primarily acrylics or oils or watercolors or other activities, other mediums like that. And you would not necessarily think that a piece that looks like this mm. might be considered fine art. 
and yet this is what I'm going for. So these are considered, in my mind, polymer clay paintings. And the paintings are, in my mind, as much fine art as anything else. Polymer clay is predominantly a craft medium. It is used widely for figurines, jewelry, and, and yet many of the jewelry artists that I know are really creating art. So that's where the, there's this really not a line at all, but, but the fact that I have won awards in shows that were of multiple mediums um, is where I'm going. That's fabulous, because it's very obvious. It's highly creative. So tell me, when you look back on your, the, during these many years that you've been creating, what are some of the, the learning experiences that stick out to you that have pushed you forward into the, this fine art you know, mindset and appreciation? Well, it goes back to the beginning. I started out working with this material, making beads and feeling not very satisfied. My background is in art and I wanted to create art, but I didn't really feel like painting. So I went looking for something different to do. And I found this material and started experimenting with it on my own. And then one day I walked into the Barnes and Noble in Rockville and there's a community art gallery and hanging in the gallery were works framed under glass that said they were made out of polymer clay and they were very colorful and I couldn't believe it. It looked like art. And so I, there was a little note, this was 2000. There was a little note that said that the creator of this work also taught classes in her home. So I called her and scheduled classes and worked with her for two years. And that was really the turning point. That was, the rest is history. Um, I worked with her techniques and I still today work with her techniques. When I go back to the techniques that I really love, it's a technique that's called the tapestry technique. And that's this background that you see here that's created by cutting and... Um, yeah, put it a little more to your left. Yeah, that's good. Then we can... Okay. Yeah. So, but I wanted this technique to be not just framed under glass, but to reflect its three-dimensional nature. Mm -hmm. So many of my pieces um, manipulate the clay in such a way that they're more three-dimensional and are still mounted so they go on the wall. Sometimes I'll call them bas-relief, that kind of a uh, thing to it. But I really moved on from what she taught me and have tried to take it in many different directions. And what I love about the material is that the possibilities are endless. You just, I never sit down at my studio and say, oh, now I'm going to do exactly what I did yesterday. It just doesn't happen. And that leads me to my next question. About, yes. Talk to us a little bit about your processes when you walk into the studio. Um, and and your, your, sounds like you have a mindset for continuous experiment. And talk a little bit about that as well. Okay. Well, first of all, the material itself, polymer clay, comes in blocks of solid color. It looks like this. There are many different colors. I rarely use the color as it comes from the package, but I start with those colors. And then the beauty of it is that the colors mix as if they're paint. So if you mix yellow and blue, you're going to get green. So I start by slicing the blocks into something that will go through the pasta machine. The pasta, <laughs> the pasta machine, also known as the clay conditioning machine, um, makes the clay into sheets of clay that feel something like leather yeah. or American cheese slices, if you will. Um, and then if you um, take the clay and you organize it something like this. 
This is known as a Skinner blend invented by someone named Judith Skinner. And if, once you put it through the pasta machine, the clay mixes. And so I then have all the colors from yellow through blue. If I kept going with this process, it would be a smooth variation. But this gives me the colors that I like to work with. So this is the beginning of the process. And so the first thing I do is pick up some colors and start mixing them and seeing what I'm going to get. And once I get something that appeals to me, I go from there. So, or if I have something in mind, for example, today I want to do the ocean or something, then I'll pick up blues and start mixing them and seeing where they're going to take me. So that's the way it works, is that I simply am mixing colors and experimenting with uh, what the various combinations are going to get, where they're going to get me. So you're continuously experimenting. Always, always. And the other thing is that there are a variety of techniques for working with the clay. And I've picked most of these up along the way from other polymer clay artists, many of whom are using the technique for jewelry that I then adapt to use for my paintings. Say something about that because we, 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 you mentioned the pasta machine. But what are some of these other tools that you're referring to? I use... I use cutters, like cookie cutters. I use very sharp knives um, and anything that will make a texture. So I'm forever, it's, it's really kind of funny. Any polymer clay artist will tell you, you prowl the hardware store for things that have interesting textures or the kitchenware store for something that will have an interesting shape. Um, it, it's endless because it it can be shaped and formed. It can be textured, it can be layered, it can be cut. So um, this process, for example, this piece mm. made by layering and cutting the clay. So it's a whole different technique than the, the brown one that I showed you. So it's a question of gathering, I would have to say, gathering tools that appear that they might add something interesting to the clay. Interesting. So do you have favorite themes in your work? Or I tend to go towards earth things, which would be the browns and the blues. It's not always that way. Obviously, the hot pink thing I just showed you is, is but it is, it's called Petal Illusion, so it still has some. But I, I tend to really enjoy blues, and blues mix um, beautifully with other colors. You put in the reds and you get the purples. You put in the yellows and you get the greens. So it's, I often pick up blue. But I, again, I try to keep myself out of a rut. And if there's something else, <laughs> If, if I feel the need to get out of a rut, I may just pick up orange and see where I go from there today. So. so is there anything you haven't brought up in this interview that you would really want to make sure that we know about your art or this medium? Well, I think it's the most important thing, at, as I've mentioned, is that it is so versatile. There's so many different things you can do with it. I also do sculpture, and I haven't even... I don't have any sculpture in this particular show. You can always see it on my website. Um, but the other thing that's so interesting about the clay is that if you cut a piece out of it and put the same shape piece back into it, and then you burnish it, it becomes a solid piece of clay again. So you can then, you can take a piece from which these shapes have been cut. This has been burnished. And it's now solid again. And so that's the basis for a great deal of my work, that once cut, I can make it back into a sheet of clay, and that becomes a part of my work. So it's those two characteristics of the clay. The colors mix like paint, and the clay can be returned to a solid sheet after it's cut that really influences what I do. That is so fascinating, and I really appreciate your giving us this information uh, and, and I'd 
look forward to going online and seeing everything else. Thank you. Thanks again, Fran Abrams. Thank you. Really glad you're part of ArtFest. Thank you. JJ Singh, welcome to MPA's 2020 Art Fest. Thank you. It's nice it's, to be here. Thank you. And it's a pleasure to meet you. So going back over time and your work, what would you say would be um, some of the most uh, formative learning experiences that got you today to really appreciate, you know, mixing uh, art and technology? That's a really good question. Um, I would say the first thing that probably got me thinking along those lines was that I grew up in a house where my father was an engineer. And so he, from the very beginning, he was just very engineering oriented, even in real life, right? And so we would often have a small problem to solve, like that, like a door doesn't shut properly. And we would figure out some sort of mechanical way to fix it. And we worked on cars together. We did a lot of that kind of problem solving where you need pieces and parts and movement. And so I think I think I just liked that problem solving element. And then, you know, when I got into art and jewelry making, I found that it applied so directly in terms of solving design problems or, you know, mechanical problems. That's probably where it all started. Oh. Fascinating. So what keeps you learning today? Definitely the internet. It is, I, I feel like I've never learned as much as quickly as I have probably in the last five to 10 years where if there's a new tool or a new process, you know, in, before you would have to either know someone who had that skill and go ask if they would teach it to you more along the lines of learning from another artist or go to a library and they wouldn't have information, but now you can just type into the computer anything you wanna learn and you can find it and you can find visual representations of it and you can you know, start to incorporate these things into your work much more quickly. So tell us, would you tell us a little bit about your processes? You know, when you walk into the studio, what are you thinking and where's, where do you, what are some of your go-to practices? And Right, so, so I'm, uh, the way I work is I'm generally very collection driven. And so I'll do, you know, usually two collections a year. And, I'm, and my collections typically have some kind of theme that um, they're centered around. So once I figure out what that theme is, that really drives the process from there. Um, but there are some similarities. I've started to use the iPad and its drawing tools a lot more than I had ever used before, before I was just sketching on paper. And I found the iPad to be a really useful tool because it's so easy to erase or move a component and come up with these concepts and ideas that you can just, you know, sort into folders and pages. And um, it's really helped with the idea generation, right? Um, so that's probably where the process starts. And, you know, it's interesting. I'm thinking about the question as, as I'm talking. Something that I think I've learned and, and come to be more comfortable with as an as a more mature artist, let's say, I'm thinking about my younger self, is that I used to spend a lot more time actually making with my hands on, and now I spend a lot more time designing in my mind because typically I know what I need to do to execute, to make something. I spend more time on the design process, the conceptualization, the planning stages, and then the execution is actually a smaller piece than it used to be maybe when I was a younger artist and I was learning more and, and, and really growing my skill set. Interesting point. So that's the kind of thing you would dream about. <laughs> I, I dream about, I do. I dream about design and I, I design in the shower. I, I draw on the shower wall, you know, ring shapes or, or whatever it is I'm working on. Do you have special devices or tools uh, for most of your work? I have a lot of specialized equipment, actually. Um, I've got, 
you know, of course, the traditional metal smithing tools, which, you know, would be a bench and a saw and a drill and those things. But more recently, I've moved into the technology side where I'm now, you know, I'm working more with my laptop. I'm working more with laser printers and specialty cutting machines. Um, I just unboxed my 3D printer, which is really exciting. And I'm starting to use that to design components for jewelry that may be like very small or mechanically oriented that then I can replicate in metal later. So sort of prototyping, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's, 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 it's a very blended studio um, in terms of the, the tools that you would find here. That, that really is, you're really keeping up with the times, We're forging ahead. Uh, are there any untried or themes? So when you mentioned processes or um, you've got two themes kind of a year, how do you decide on these themes? Um, one versus the other, and do you do they ever overlap or, you know, just tell us something about your themes. We so, shop. so it's generally one of two ways. Sometimes I'm inspired by a new tool um, or a new technique. And I just, I fall in love with the tool or the technique and I'm, and I just want to sort of explore what can it do. And then I'll just apply that process to sort of everything I'm doing in a collection for that particular collection. The other way is more, um, I would say, more of an intuitive thing. Uh, and I'll use this falls collection as an example. Um, this has been a rough year for a lot of people. It's been a really rough year for our family. We've had some family members with some health issues. And so I felt the need for protection. And I was feeling very strongly that I wanted to design jewelry that had historical significance that were um, historical, based on historical jewelry pieces of either bringing you good luck or pushing away bad fortune. And so I started reading about talismans and amulets and evil eyes. And, and I just, I very quickly realized, okay, that's my theme. My theme is going to be these, these trinkets that either are meant to bring you fortune or maybe withhold bad luck. Interesting. Wow. That is really fascinating. So what would you advise artists, um, how they can bring more art into the community as a professional? I would say that a, my advice would probably depend a lot on your medium. Um, I think it's a very medium specific kind of question. What I might advise someone who's a jeweler to do would be a little bit different than some of the mixed media um, arts. But speaking to jewelry specifically, since that's my field, um, I, I actually think that getting online and building Instagram profiles and maybe even, dare I say it, a TikTok page, you know, whatever the latest platform is, um, I, we're moving there. And, and customers are getting younger. You know, I, I use Facebook, I use Instagram, I use all of these different platforms. And what I figured out is that my, my customer demographic is really unique to each platform. So I will... I will um, present myself differently on Facebook as a business than I would on Instagram because I have very different audiences in those two places. So to, to answer your question more specifically, I, I think I would just say, you know, put yourself out there digitally, especially in today's environment of, you know, the coronavirus and things like that. Um, the world is moving digitally in any case. And I think people are getting much more comfortable looking and shopping for art online than they ever were before. Very good point, very good point. So how do you support other artists and how do they support you? So probably the biggest way I support other artists is through my teaching. I, I figured out 15 years ago that I absolutely love to teach. It probably is something else that my father imparted on me. Um, it brings me joy. And I, I love not only teaching a skill, but I really enjoy helping people find their own voice 
as a jeweler. Oftentimes people will come in and say, I want to make that exact ring that was on your website. I want to learn to make that exact thing, right? And then I, I gently tr sort of show them how they can learn the skills, but they can make something that is unique to their personal voice that they can then carry forward, right? So helping people find their voice and their authenticity through the medium that I'm teaching is um, probably the biggest way that I feel that I can uh, contribute to the art community. Um, I mean, what do I receive from the art community? I mean, so much. There's, you know, events like this event that we're talking about today. Um, you know, I am in Great Falls, Virginia. We've got a fabulous artist group in, in our area. Um, and I work with that organization on membership. So just bringing people in, you know, finding ways for people to collaborate across mediums is a passion of mine. So there's a lot of give and I feel like artists in general tend to be very giving people naturally. And so there's a lot of giving and collaboration and sharing of ideas. That's great. Is there anything that I haven't asked you about your practice, your uh, artistic world that you want us to know that we haven't had a chance to hear yet? Mm. I mean, well, you've asked some really good questions. Um, I, guess, I guess I would just say that um, it's okay as an artist to sort of to go in fits and spurts because we're not always in a place where we can mm. give everything we have to our art all the time. And, you know, there's a balance between our families and if we have, you know, a professional career outside of our art or, you know, our kids, whatever, that it's okay if we're not always functioning at maximum creativity, right? you know, to give ourselves a little break. And I, and I feel like I've had to practice that this year. I'm, I can be pretty hard on myself in terms of being a bit of a perfectionist and, and just wanting to do more, 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 more. And I have more ideas than I have time. So I have to pick and choose what is it that I'm going to do. And, you know, it's okay if I don't get it all done because, you know, it's a balancing act. And so I'm, I'm practicing being a little easier on myself as an artist if I can't produce as at the level of volume that I would like to because of things I can't control. And then that'll just give you more energy in the long run anyway. I think so. I think so. Well, JJ is saying it was delightful to speak with you. And I asked that our audience go to the MPA Art Fest website in order to see the studio pages for our artists. It's been an absolute pleasure. I've interviewed a number of artists, but there's 52 to check out. Okay. So please join us in the coming days.